This is Randy Shell, and I'm making a video cast on respiratory anatomy, physiology, and thoracic anesthesia topics. It's a keyword-based review, and it's part of our University of Kentucky Department of Anesthesiology didactic series. Let's first look at the keywords from 2017 on these topics. The first is volatile agents and ventilatory effects, and it's a basic content outline uh, keyword. Volatile agents we know cause a increase in respiratory rate, a decrease in tidal volume, and block the hypoxic and hypercarbic response. There's quite a few questions on airway anatomy and innervation, difficult airway management, single lung ventilation, and hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, and the advantages of bronchial blockers versus double lumen tubes, the management of some complications of airway issues such as laryngospasm and post-obstructive pulmonary edema, carbon monoxide poisoning, the differential diagnosis, in a patient that's been burned, for example, the pulmonary changes that occur as a patient ages, hyperbaric oxygen, the indications for it, lung alter sonography, near drowning pathophysiology, whether it's in salt water or fresh water, for example, upper respiratory tract airway reactivity after a upper respiratory tract infection. We know that it can be up to six weeks or more before airway reactivity goes back down towards normal and patients can have laryngospasm perioperatively when the airway is manipulated. ABG values measured versus calculated. We know that pH and PaO2 and PaCO2 are measured while calculated is bicarbonate and base deficit. And with ARDS, we know that keeping the tidal volume a little bit lower, six mils per kilogram, for example, and peak airway pressures less than 30 or so, or plateau pressures less than 30, is optimal uh, in patients with adult respiratory distress syndrome. Then there's some others listed here. Gap in knowledge refers to a keyword where more than 50% of people who took the exam in 2017 missed the question, and it had to do with the posterior cricoarachnoid muscle, which is solely responsible for pulling apart uh, the vocal cords, abduction, and they're attached between the posterior cricoid cartilage and the arachnoid cartilage is bilateral, and we'll look at that in some pictures in a couple slides later. 2016, there was uh, respiratory keywords listed here. Again, B stands for the basic content, A stands for the advanced content, and this is what we will be using as we go in part one through part three of these topics. But the gaps in knowledge in 2016, again, the questions or keywords that more than 50% of uh, people taking the exam missed are listed here. And this is as minute ventilation increases linearly in a mechanically ventilated patient, alveolar CO2 decreases asymptotically with a more rapid decline initially, meaning like if you're at five liters a minute and go up to seven or eight liters a minute versus if you were at 15 liters per minute and go up to 20 liters per minute, uh, PaCO2 decreases asymptotically towards zero, uh, and we will talk more about that. When a patient develops a seizure during hyperbaric oxygen, what do you do? Well, discontinue the inhaled oxygen, it's oxygen toxicity. Uh, you usually don't have to give them a benzodiazepine or something to stop the seizure. It's the oxygen itself that's causing the problem. During one lung ventilation, there's a lot of things that can inhibit or attenuate hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and ACE inhibitors. Anything that vasodilates, anything that vasoconstricts or changes the set point of the hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstrictive response in a patient alters HPV and can alter oxygenization during one lung ventilation. Gaps in knowledge in 2015, the fact that the hypercapnia that can occasionally be seen in COPD patients after you put them on oxygen isn't due to blunting of the brainstem response uh, uh, to our respiratory gases, but it's primarily due as you breathe oxygen, the alveolus gets higher levels of oxygen and it opens up the blood flow that's going past it and you get more and more VQ mismatching and uh, dead space and CO2 rises because of that. Lipogenesis and respiratory quotients. We'll talk more about respiratory quotients, especially as it relates to the alveolar gas equation. And then strong ion deficit, or the def difference between the cations and the anions, and the fact that when you're dehydrated and your sodium goes up, a cation, the difference between cations and anions becomes even greater. So strong ion deficit increases 
in the face of dehydration. That was a gap in knowledge in 2015, and we'll go more into that. But let's start right in on airway innervation. If you were going to do a nasal innervation on a patient, you would have to block the distribution of the fifth cranial nerve, because cranial nerve number five supplies the nose and the nasopharynx. The tongue oral pharynx in the upper part of the epiglottis, the gag reflex, is cranial nerve number nine. And everything else is supplied by cranial nerve number 10, or the vagus nerve. And if you look at the graphic on the top far right, you can see in yellow uh, that the uh, superior laryngeal nerve and the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is in green, uh, are branches of the vagus nerve. And they innervate from the epiglottis down through our airway. So cranial nerve number 10 supplies most of our airway innervation. And the graphic on the bottom right shows in light blue the fifth cranial nerve distribution, nose and nasopharynx, yellow being the glossopharyngeal or ninth cranial nerve, uh, the tongue and the um, oral pharynx and upper epiglottis and the gag reflex, and then the pink being the distribution of the vagus nerve. So let's look at the uh, vagus nerve. It divides into the superior laryngeal nerve, which is shown in orange in the top right, and there's two branches. The internal branch pierces the thyrohyoid membrane up here at the top, goes inside, and supplies sensation above the vocal cords. While the external branch, again in orange, but heading down here, um, it is motor to the cricothyroid muscle. Now the cricothyroid muscle is a tensor, and if you damage this nerve, you can get a wispy voice, but you're not going to get airway obstruction. The superior laryngeal nerve can be blocked at the thyrohyoid membrane bilaterally, sticking a needle right near this uh, point where the superior laryngeal nerve goes internally on each side, and injecting a local anesthetic can block the SLN, superior laryngeal nerve. Now the recurrent laryngeal nerve is shown in green, and it is sensory below the glottis. And so our trachea and everything down is recurrent laryngeal nerve, and that nerve is very important because it's motor to all the nerves of the larynx, except the cricothyroid, which you remember, is supplied by the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve, uh, shown in the graphic at the very top. So recurrent laryngeal nerve, sensation below the vocal cords and all the muscles except the cricothyroid, that tensor, it can be blocked by simply putting a needle through the cricothyroid membrane and injecting local anesthetic into the trachea. The patient coughs and it distributes up and down inside the trachea. Now damage unilaterally can cause voice changes and hoarseness, but it's when it's bilateral we can get into some problems. If it's a partial injury bilaterally, the vocal cords can be stuck in an adducted position, that is, together with acute obstruction. That's even worse than if they were completely transected, because if they're completely transected, the vocal cords kind of flap in the wind, but in a paramedian position, and air can move in and out. If they're bilaterally partially injured, a tracheostomy may be immediately required um, to uh, solve your airway problem. Looking at laryngeal anatomy next, the recurrent laryngeal nerve, that branch of the vagus, we said supplied all muscles except the tensor, the cricothyroid, which was supplied by the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. The uh, top picture shows the vocal cords in a closed and open position. Note the epiglottis, the position of the true vocal cords versus the false vocal cords laterally to the true cords the arachnoids at the bottom, cranicular and cuneiform cartilage, and at the sides, the piriform fossa. And that piriform fossa is where often our NG tubes are caught when we're trying to pass them uh, orally into the stomach or nasally into the stomach. Sometimes when we're doing fiber optic innovations and our scope uh, gets caught on the side and you see a light in the side of the neck, it may be in the piriform fossa. If you look at the posterior cricoarachnoids, the picture at the bottom right, those little muscles, when they pull, cause a rotation of the cartilage and a pulling apart of the vocal cords, so abduction by the posterior cricoarachnoids. And that was something that was missed, a gap in knowledge, in uh, 2017. Adduction is the lateral cricoarachnoids. And again, if they, those lateral muscles on the side, pull and rotate the little cartilages, it pulls the vocal cords medial uh, or adducted. Uh, 
um, such that they're closed. Airway examination and grade. When we have a patient open their mouth and see what we can view, the pillars of the tonsil, the uvula, the hard palate, the soft palate, if we can see all of those, we call that a class one malapati airway. Class three, however, is where you cannot see the epiglottis, only the base of it. Um, and in class four, you cannot see anything but the hard palate. And we, when we do laryngoscopy, we grade the airway. A grade one being what we hope we are going to see, and that is everything, the vocal cords, the epiglottis, the cuneiform cartilages. And a grade three would be where we look and don't even see the cartilage. All we see is the epiglottis, and usually with some manipulation, we can get a tube around that epiglottis uh, into the trachea. And a grade four is where we don't see anything. We don't see the epiglottis at all. Now there's some components of the preoperative airway physical examination that I'd like to point out. One, the inter incisor distance or mouth opening. We'll often uh, put our fingers up there and say, okay, do they have at least three finger breaths mouth opening? And then we'll often put our fingers between the thyroid and the mentum in their neck and see if they have at least that six to seven centimeters or three finger breaths or so space. And then, uh, if we're really careful sometimes, uh, we'll measure the neck of a patient because we know that thick necks are associated with a difficult airway. Size greater than 17 inches, or in uh, some places it will be described as 44 centimeters. The thicker the neck, the potential for more difficulty. Cricoid pressure. There's some controversy about applying cricoid pressure. Uh, we know that when you push on cricoid pressure, you're closing off the oropharynx and the hope is that if a patient regurgitates, um, that it will not come up into the uh, oropharynx and down into the trachea. But we also know that when you press on the cricoid cartilage, it actually decreases the lower esophageal sphincter tone. Thyroid pressure, uh, when we push on that cartilage, which is higher than the cricoid cartilage, that's called the Burt maneuver. Back up to the right and posterior is a way to try to improve the grade of laryngoscopy. Let's say you're having a hard time grade three seeing anything, you do the burp maneuver and often it will go to a grade two where it's easier to intubate. Difficult airway algorithm published by the American Society of Anesthesiology. If you get into the situation where you cannot ventilate and cannot innovate, you're gonna put a supraglottic airway down in most situations, a laryngeal mask airway. If a patient had a supraglottic tumor blocking the vocal cords, that would not be indicated. But in most situations, a supraglottic airway laryngeal mask can get you out of a situation where you're not able to ventilate and not able to intubate and convert it to a can ventilate situation and give you time to do something else, such as fiber optic intubation, Aintree, other uh, modes of getting a tube into the trachea. However, if your supraglottic airway fails, your saturations drop, and you cannot ventilate, you've been unable to intubate, the LMA fails, an invasive airway like a cricothyrotomy or jet ventilation is indicated. Airway anesthesia, let's talk about how we can do nerve blocks uh, prior to, for example, an awake fiber optic intubation. On the far left shows a, shows a superior laryngeal nerve block, the internal way of doing it, not done very often, but a Krauss's forceps can be soaked with local anesthetic and uh, put way back in the posterior pharynx um, and uh, held there on each side in the piriform recess. That will get the internal branches of the superior laryngeal nerve, which is, uh, is the epiglottis, basically, the upper part of the epiglottis. Superior laryngeal nerve block can be done with a needle externally where the needle is between the thyrohyoid bones and in the thyrohyoid membrane bilaterally. And it's somewhat painful to do and therefore not done very frequently, but the internal branch uh, of the superior laryngeal nerve um, uh, can be blocked in this way. The glossopharyngeal nerve could be blocked uh, by a needle injection of local anesthetic at the gutter on each side of the tongue, right next to the tonsillar pillar. That's not done very frequently either because it's painful. So transtracheal anesthesia is a way to get the distribution of the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is an injection of local anesthetic through the cricothyroid membrane, for example. The patient coughs and spreads it up and down, and the distribution of the recurrent laryngeal nerve is uh, blocked.
but airway anesthesia usually is done with a spray and go a technique in many institutions after the airway's been dried with glycopyrrolate remember the anticholinergic glycopyrrolate is a quaternary amine that does not cross the blood vein barrier doesn't cause sedation or uh, pupillary changes lidocaine med neb can be used local anesthetic spray to the back of the throat benzocaine or lidocaine remember that benzocaine spray is associated with meth hemoglobinemia which is the conversion of Fe plus 2 in hemoglobin to Fe plus 3, or met hemoglobin. The uh, glossopharyngeal nerve block, previously discussed, spirolaryngeal nerve block also, and uh, trans uh, um, cricoid injection of local anesthetic, all also can be used as part of airway anesthesia. Let's talk about innervation of the airways next. The parasympathetics are rich innovators of the bronchi and the bronchioles of our airways. And the parasympathetics release acetylcholine onto muscarinic receptors and cause bronchoconstriction. It is ipotropium, the inhaled anticholinergic, that many COPD patients use in an attempt to open up uh, their airways. Sympathetics, sparser innervation, our circulating catecholamines from our adrenal can have an effect on the beta-2 receptors that are present in our bronchioles and cause bronchodilation. We give albuterol and IV epinephrine for its beta-2 effect in an attempt to cause bronchodilation via increasing intracellular cyclic AMP. And histamine, for example, in anaphylaxis or allergic reactions, uh, when histamine stimulates the H1 receptor, it results in bronchoconstriction. H2 stimulation actually causes bronchodilation and therefore the worry of giving an H2 blocker to an asthmatic patient that you could block, block the bronchodilatory effect of the H2 receptor. The graphic on the right uh, shows in blue the vagus nerve coming down and in pinkish red the sympathetic nerves supplying the lung and on the left side the phrenic nerve coming off C3, 4, and 5 supplying the diaphragm, and then the intercostal supplying the muscles of our, uh, our lung. Albuterol versus ipotropium. Next topic. Albuterol is an inhaled beta agonist used to treat acute bronchospasm and asthma. It relaxes smooth muscle. The duration of action is about uh, four hours, uh, and tolerance can develop. Therefore, asthmatic patients usually are not given Albuterol to be used around the clock, but as rescue inhaler. Side effects of giving albuterol, beta-2 agonism results in some patients in tachycardia and also drives potassium into the cell or hypokalemia. Remember that beta agonist can be one mode of treatment in a patient who's hyperkalemic, hyperkalemic along with insulin and glucose and uh, hyperventilation, beta agonism can be used to drive potassium into the cell in the hyperkalemic patient. Ipotropium, compared to albuterol, is an anticholinergic. It's antagonistic to acetylcholine. In an emphysema and chronic bronchitic patients, it has special benefits. So COPD patients often on ipotropium. It has a slower onset, lasts four to six hours, doesn't seem to have the tolerance that's observed with albuterol, doesn't seem to cause the tachycardia that can occur with albuterol, and maybe quotes best for treating bronchospasm with tracheal instrumentation because remember that our airways are richly parasympathetically, parasympathetically innervated. Also, intravenous glycoparlate can be used to block the parasympathetic uh, bronchoconstrictive effect of airway instrumentation. The next topic is ventilatory effects of inhaled agents. When you're breathing sevoflurane, isoflurane, or desflurane, without neuromuscular blockade or other drugs on board, the patients will usually breathe in a low tidal volume, high respiratory rate, or panting. Because the tidal volume decreases, the alveolar minute ventilation is decreased. The ratio of dead space over tidal volume actually goes down, for example, that is, goes up. For example, if a patient is breathing with a tidal volume of 450 awake, and has a normal anatomic dead space of 150 mils, the ratio of 150 mils over 450 mils is one third, and that is the normal VD over VT, 0.3. Now, if that patient is breathing a volatile anesthetic and their tidal volume goes down to, let's say, 300, 
their dead space stays the same at 150, so now you have dead space 150 over tidal volume 300, and the ratio of VD over VT goes to 0.5. And now you can see why CO2 rises in a patient, at least one of the reasons why CO2 rises in a patient who's breathing a volatile anesthetic. The volatile anesthetics are all bronchodilators of the lower airways. We do know that desflurane is an irritant of the upper airways. The ventilatory response to CO2 is depressed and PaO2 is greatly depressed even at low concentrations of volatile anesthetics. So if a patient under inhaled volatile anesthetic encounters a situation where their CO2 rises, they will not hyperventilate as much in response. If their oxygen in what they're breathing goes down, normally we should hyperventilate to a hypoxic uh, alveolar condition. But if a volatile anesthetic is on board, they will not hyperventilate. In fact, it only takes 0.1 or 0.2 mac to greatly depress the hypoxic response. It takes a lot more of volatile anesthetic to depress the uh, carbon dioxide response. What about control of breathing? The central chemoreceptors in the medulla respond to changes in carbon dioxide. In fact, carbon dioxide crosses the blood-brain barrier uh, and hydrogen ion is formed around the brain stem and that is a stimulus for increased respiration. It is not the hydrogen ion per se that's crossing the blood-brain barrier, it's the CO2. So you can see why respiratory acidosis causes a increase in respiratory rate while a metabolic acidosis acutely would not cause the same because the hydrogen ion does not cross the blood-brain barrier like CO2 does. The point that was made in the gap in knowledge about COPD patients give, be given, who are given oxygen and the fact that giving oxygen to a COPD patient can increase their carbon dioxide level, a worry that I was taught many, many years ago in medical school was it was a brainstem effect. Well, we know now that it is not. It appears to be a VQ mismatch because oxygen that the patient's breathing decreases hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction in areas of the lung that should be constricted uh, because they're not being ventilated well. And so it's basically messing with HPV and increasing VQ mismatch. Now peripheral chemoreceptors are in the uh, carotid and they respond to changes in partial pressure of oxygen, the tension of oxygen. This is not the saturation, this is not the content, do not confuse those. It's the tension, PaO2, of oxygen that they're responding to. And when the PaO2 goes down, respiratory rate and uh, tidal volume go up, respiratory stimulation. So in the graphic on the far right, you can see the red star is showing the peripheral chemoreceptors at the carotid body and the central chemoreceptors in the brainstem. And the central chemoreceptors responding to CO2 and the peripheral chemoreceptors responding to P little a O2. Ventilatory response at altitude is the next key word. What happens when you acutely go up to altitude? Well, you breathe faster. Your minute ventilation goes up. Both respiratory rate and tidal volume go up. And the reason why that happens is because, let's say, for example, you're up at 20,000 feet altitude. The barometric pressure is a lot lower, and therefore the P big AO2, or the alveolar oxygen level, goes down dramatically in your alveolus. If it goes down in your alveolus, it also goes down in your blood, so your PaO2 goes down, and your carotid body says, my PaO2 is low, I better cause hyperventilation, and that's what results. Respiratory rate and tidal volume goes up, increasing then P big AO2 in the alveolus, and decreasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the alveolus and then in the blood. So the patient develops a respiratory alkalosis, and in compensation, the kidneys say, I've got to get rid of bicarb to get my pH back towards normal. So you start peeing bicarbonate. Diamox or acetylsolamide accelerates this process. It calls that bicarbonateuria. You pee bicarbonate, and it causes you to uh, be metabolically acidotic and continue the hyperventilatory response for a longer period of time and acclimate uh, better. So acute mountain sickness, some people will take prophylactic diamox. I have taken it before when I've cycled at 12,000 feet and above. Um, it inhibits carbonic anhydrase such that uh, excretion of bicarbonate occurs, the blood becomes acidified, 
and you hyperventilate more and it actually shifts the P50 to the right, delivering oxygen to the tissues better. So one of the uh, treatments for changes in sea level to high altitude is physiologically hyperventilation, but pharmacologic can be Diamox. Now, if you have a great decrease in P big AO2, the blood vessels going by those alveolus constrict. That's hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. And if you're globally hypoxic, all your alveolar hypoxia, you're up at the top of Mount Everest, for example, you can have constriction of those pulmonary vessels and pulmonary hypertension. And the pressures can be so high that you can get capillary leak, acute pulmonary edema, you can get right heart failure. And the treatment for this is get them down off of high altitude to a lower altitude and a higher barometric pressure, give them oxygen, uh, and not only the lungs can be affected by high altitude, but the brain can become edematous. Uh, when it's the lung, it's called high altitude pulmonary edema. When it's the brain, it's called high altitude cerebral edema. Get them down to a, a lower level, give them oxygen, put them in pressure bags. Decadron is another treatment for this. CO2 response curve is the next key word, and we know that between a C PaCO2 of about 20 all the way up to 80, there's a linear relationship such that as CO2 goes up, we ventilate more. That CO2 response curve is changed by many things, including our anesthetics. And so the graphic on the far right is meant to demonstrate that as a patient is anesthetized, deeply anesthetized with narcotics and inhaled agents, there's a shift in the CO2 response curve down and to the right such that it takes more CO2 to get the same alveolar ventilatory response, so a blunting of that CO2 response uh, by our inhaled anesthetics and opioid. When you stimulate the patient surgically, it shifts it a little bit back up and to the left. Um, another thing that occurs with inhaled anesthetics is our apneic threshold, or the point at uh, which we have this tendency to breathe, and if we go below that CO2, there's not a tendency to breathe. And the example of that is a laryngeal mask airway, a patient breathing spontaneously, the untitled CO2 is 55, and you say, I don't want it to be 55. So you take over the bag and you ventilate them down to 40, and then let them try to breathe on their own again, and they don't breathe until their CO2 rises back up into the 50s, and that's the apneic threshold. The alveolar ventilation PaCO2 relationship and hypoxia, basically, if a patient is uh, uh, having hypoxemia at the same time uh, that their RCO2, arterial CO2 goes up, they will have an even stronger ventilatory response, which is good because if your CO2 is going up and your oxygen is going down, you really want to breathe a lot. So the combination of hypoxia and hypercarbia makes an even greater ventilatory response than either alone. The next key word is relationship of alveolar ventilation to PaCO2. And the gap in knowledge at which more than 50% of people missed this key word or topic was that as minute ventilation increases linearly in a mechanically ventilated patient, alveolar carbon dioxide decreases asymptotically with a more rapid decline initially. Now that's a lot of words and the graphic on the right is an attempt to show what this means. In the x-axis is alveolar ventilation in liters per minute and on the y-axis is the PaCO2. And you can see down around 5 liters per minute alveolar ventilation. You can go up to the CO2 and over uh, to the y-axis and see what the CO2 would be. And as the alveolar ventilation goes up to 10 liters and then to 15 liters and then to 20 liters, the PO2CO2 decreases, but not nearly as much as down when it's around 3, 4, and 5 liters, for example. So a couple points here. One, if a patient, let's say, is breathing at 4 liters per minute and you give them uh, an opioid or sedative, and change even just a little bit of their ventilation down to let's say three liters per minute, you can see why their CO2 rises dramatically as opposed to if they were breathing at 15 liters per minute and you decreased it down to 12 liters per minute, their CO2 would not change very much. So when you're at low levels of alveolar ventilation and block their ventilation with a sedative or opioid, hypercapnia is going to ensue. The next topic is hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. And the 
HPV response is a response to alveolar oxygen. So the, how much of oxygen is inside the alveolus, which is P big AO2. And if the P big AO2 decreases in alveolar segment, or in the whole lung for that matter, the blood vessels going by that unit say, there's no oxygen in the alveolus, so why bring blood here? So the pulmonary artery constricts and sends blood away to maybe an alveolar unit that has more oxygen in it. Now, if this is a global effect, for example, you're up at the top of Mount Everest, then the alveolar vessels constrict all over and the right heart's not going to like it and right heart failure can occur and pulmonary hypertension can occur. But if this was, for example, one lung ventilation with a double lumen tube, the lung that is not being ventilated, the alveolar oxygen goes down and the blood going past it then would be decreased. It would vasoconstrict and shunt blood over to the lung that is being ventilated. There's things that inhibit HPV. Anything that changes the preferred and optimal uh, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstrictive tone of that vessel. So if anything vasodilates or vasoconstricts, it's changing the set point, which is the optimal one set by the body. So inhaled anesthetics uh, can vasodilate and they can have an effect on HPV. However, clinically it's not very much. Um, and in one lung ventilation patients, sometimes people will switch to a TIVA-based anesthetic when they're having problems with oxygenization because of that small effect of inhaled anesthetics on HPV. However, systemic vasodilators like nitroglycerin and nitroprusside, if you turn those on in a patient who's on one lung ventilation, for example, they can vasodilate those uh, pulmonary vessels that shouldn't be vasodilated and send blood to the alveolar units that don't have oxygen in them and your PaO2 drops. So it is not uncommon when you start a nitroglycerin or nitroprusside infusion for your PaO2 to drop a little bit. For example, it's running at 200, you draw blood gas, after you start nitroprusside, now it's 150 and you can say, aha, that's causing vasodilation of the pulmonary vessels, change their set point, sending blood to alveoli without a lot of oxygen in them and messing with hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Systemic vasoconstrictors like norepinephrine can do that also, but normally we think of vasodilators and our inhaled anesthetics as the ones that mess with HPV, while our TIVA-based anesthetics, such as remifentanil and propofol and others, have little effect at all on HPV. What about the metabolic functions of the lung? Activation of angiotensin 1 is in the lung to angiotensin 2. Remember angiotensinogen uh, and renin and the whole renin angiotensin system. It's angiotensin 1 to 2 that occurs in the lung and ACE inhibitors inhibit that uh, angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 conversion in the lung. So the lung activates angiotensin 1 but it inactivates many other things and in fact um, uh, serotonin is almost completely removed. Uh, most of norepinephrine is removed. Epi has little effect uh, as it goes through the lung. The lung also makes surfactant. Uh, prostaglandins are removed from the circulation, but they're also synthesized and released into the blood when lung tissue is stretched and the fibrinolytic system in the lung is important if you develop a clot to break down clots that are in the lung. So the lung has metabolic functions, activating angiotensin 1 and inactivating norepinephrine and serotonin and some others. And in a patient with serotonin syndrome, with uh, uh, carcinoid syndrome that is, with lots of serotonin around, let's say they have metastasis to their liver and their lung and they're getting lots of serotonin, they can develop symptoms of too much serotonin with a flushing, etc. Here's a question for you. Which airway nerve block would increase the risk of pulmonary aspiration of regurgitated gastric contents the most? Well, superior laryngeal nerve we know is sensory above the vocal cords. The glossopharyngeal is the gag reflex. The uh, phrenic nerve is the muscle to the diaphragm. And recurrent laryngeal nerve is glottis uh, down. And so that is the one that would increase the risk the most. And so when I'm doing an awake fiber optic innovation in a patient with a full stomach, for example, that's something to worry about because if you do a transtracheal injection and numb up the distribution of the recurrent laryngeal nerve and they regurgitate, they're going to aspirate all the way down and out far into their lung before they cough. The next topic is oxygenization and some equations related to oxygenization. 
the alveolar gas equation is the first one. And that is used to calculate P big AO2 using FiO2, the atmospheric pressure, the water vapor pressure, carbon dioxide level in the blood, and the R value, which is the respiratory quotient. So if we use one atmosphere, which is 760 millimeters of mercury, and we use vapor pressure uh, at 37 degrees of water being 47, that's where we get the PaO2 equals 0.21 FiO2 of room air, 760 minus 47, about 713 or so, minus CO2 of 40 in our blood, PaCO2, over our respiratory quotient, uh, estimated average being about 0.8, which makes 50 on the other side of the equation. So um, that's how we use the alveolar gas equation to try to calculate P big AO2. So what is respiratory quotient? That's the ratio of the amount of carbon dioxide produced to that of CO2 consumed. So carbon dioxide over oxygen. And in the case of carbohydrates, let's say you uh, metabolize a C6 carbon carbohydrate, uh, you produce six molecules of CO2 for every six molecules of oxygen consumed, six over six is one, therefore the ratio is of respiratory quotient is one. Proteins, it's 0.8, and lipids, it's the least at 0.7. And therefore, the concept in the ICU occasionally where nutrients can change weaning, such that if you want less carbon dioxide produced from the same caloric nutrient load, switching a patient off of carbohydrates, which form a lot of CO2, to lipid nutrients, at least more of their calories coming from that, can reduce the amount of CO2 produced and possibly help with the weaning of a patient. AA gradient is the difference between the alveolus, which we calculate from the alveolar gas equation, and the little a, which we get from the arterial blood gas. And the PF ratio is the ratio of PaO2 to FiO2. And if a patient has a PaO2 normally of about 95 to 100 in their blood, breathing room air, you or I, breathing room air at point to one FiO2, the ratio of 100 over 0.2 is approximately 500. Uh, that's called the PF ratio. And when it's less than 300, that's consistent with acute lung injury. The next topic is oxygenization, delivery, and use. Let's start up at the top right graphic, looking at PaO2, normally breathing room air in a normal patient, about 100 millimeters of mercury with a saturation of 98%, leaves the uh, the uh, lung heading towards the left atrium and the pulmonary veins. The heart ejects. It has a hemoglobin of about 15 grams per deciliter. The cardiac output is normally about five liters per minute, and that's heart rate times stroke volume. And the amount of oxygen that's delivered to the tissues then depends upon cardiac output, the amount of blood that's going to the tissues, times the amount of oxygen that's in the blood that's being delivered to the tissues, which is the content. The content calculation is an important one, which says that dissolved oxygen, small amount of content, 0.003 times PaO2, plus what's bound to hemoglobin, the most portion of the content, 1.34 mils of oxygen for each gram of hemoglobin times our saturation. And our DO2, or delivery of oxygen to the tissues, then is cardiac output, the flow, times the content, and we times it by 10 to put it in uh, liters. So DO2 is about 1,000 mils a minute going to the tissues. Uh, and if we use that number and say at the tissues, we are using at basal metabolic rates, one met, one metabolic equivalent, equal to about 250 mils of oxygen a minute. So if we're delivering 1,000, and we're only using 250, you can see why when the blood comes back to the pulmonary artery, it has a saturation of about 75% and not 0%. Um, we're not using all of the oxygen. Now, metabolic equivalent of 250 is something that's important to remember. Uh, that's our basal metabolic rate. If we have a patient who we want to know their functional status, we often ask them, can you climb two flights of stairs? And two flights of stairs is approximately four metabolic equivalents. Four metabolic equivalents would be four times 250 mils a minute or a thousand mils a minute. Can you make that demand? Can you meet that demand when you're climbing those stairs? And if they can, we say, uh-huh, they can probably do well 
uh, going through a surgery. Now the VO2, as we said, is the tissue use, which is the cardiac output times the difference between the content of arterial minus venous blood, and when blood comes back to the heart, right side, and out into the pulmonary artery, that's the mixed venous oxygen, normally a saturation of about 75%, and a PaO2 of about 40. So oxygen delivery is DO2, cardiac output times content, we pointed out what content was, which hemoglobin is the major portion of it, and then oxygen use is the difference between the oxygen content arterial minus venous blood times cardiac output, and we said that the basal metabolic rate for oxygen in a normal person is about 250 mils a minute if they're doing nothing. That's basal. Next topic, a little bit easier to understand, oxygen dissociation curve and some of the factors affecting it. What shifts it to the right and what shifts it to the left? To the right is reduced affinity, meaning that uh, the hemoglobin releases the oxygen to the tissues better. Things like being warmer, higher 2,3 DPG, as diphosphoglycerate, um, pH um, changes, more hydrogen ion or acidosis shifts it to the right and delivers more oxygen to the tissues. As opposed to a left shift is things like being cold and having low 2,3 DPG and and uh, alkalosis and carbon monoxide shifts the curve to the left. So tissue pH, if it was acidotic, a low pH, there's a tendency for uh, hemoglobin to release oxygen to those acidotic tissues, which is a good thing. Now P50, in a normal patient, the PaO2 at which 50% of hemoglobin has oxygen bound to it, if we look graphically here, it's about 27 and that's normal. Take the x-axis, 27 PaO2, go up to the graphic uh, curve, and then go over to the left, which is the oxyhemoglobin saturation at 50. That's the P50. Normally, we say it's 27. The fetus has a lower P50. It wants to grab on and hold on to that maternal oxygen that's being delivered to it. Pregnancy, maybe just a little bit higher than normal. Uh, sickle cell shifts it to the far right. Um, so those are some factors that change the oxygen dissociation curve right or to the left. Hypoxia, what are some of the physiologic effects of hypoxia? The next key word. SAO2 of 90%, it correlates with a PaO2 in most people have at about 60 millimeters of mercury. We already said that the P50, if our saturation is 50%, our PaO2 is way down at about 27. So therefore the worry when our uh, SpO2, which is a reflection of what we believe is going on with SAO2, pulse oximeter starts dropping down to 90%. We say, ooh, our PO2 is about 60 or less, and we start adding PEEP and suctioning and trying to find out the reasons why. And if it was 50% saturation, although it doesn't uh, have good correlation at these low levels, we say that would be the P50 of 27 millimeters of mercury. When the lungs are exposed to low oxygen, the alveolus has low oxygen. Remember, that's low alveolar oxygen creates HPV, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. The blood vessels going past constrict in response to that alveolar being, oxygen being low, and the pulmonary artery pressure goes up. Hypoxia increases pulmonary artery pressure. In the brain, hypoxia stimulates us to breathe more. Um, blood flow goes up to the head. In fact, if you have a patient who has a traumatic brain injury and a traumatic chest injury uh, where their ICP is high and you hyperventilate them to get their CO2 down and reduce intracranial pressure, <clears throat> if you cannot control their oxygen, uh, get it up higher than 50 or 60, you're having real problems with hypoxia, you're gonna have a really hard time controlling your intracranial pressure because when the PaO2, P little AO2, gets less than 50, cerebral blood flow increases dramatically. Normally, PaO2 has little effect on cerebral blood flow uh, because uh, when it's above 50, very little effect, all the way up into the 300 or more. When you start to get maybe a little vasoconstriction to high levels of PaO2, you don't get vasodilation until you're very low levels of PaO2. So very low levels of oxygen, hypoxia, increases cerebral blood flow. In the cardiovascular system, our heart says, I want to live just like the brain does, and catecholamines go up, and our heart rate goes up, and our blood pressure goes up, and our cardiac output goes up in response to the stress of hypoxia. However, 
if you have profound hypoxia, eventually you get bradycardia, hypotension, and low cardiac output. This is the normal adult response to hypoxia, initial hypoxia, is that reflex increase in catecholamines and blood pressure and heart rate and cardiac output. But in infants, when they get hypoxic, they are parasympathetic animals and they become bradycardic. So if an infant kid is suddenly changing their heart rate from 140 down to 60, you better think that I'm not ventilating and I'm not oxygenating well enough because that's probably the cause. Now what about CO2 transport and CO2 dissociation? Carbon dioxide is carried around the blood mainly as bicarbonate and uh, carbonic anhydrous uh, catalyzes those reactions. CO2 can also bind to hemoglobin. Yes, CO2 can also be dissolved in solution, but it's mainly carried around as bicarbonate as shown in the graphic at the top right. Now there's an effect called the Haldane effect and the Bohr effect. The Haldane effect is occurring at the tissues such that uh, when the blood gets to the tissues and releases oxygen, it is better set up to pick up carbon dioxide. So release of oxygen at the tissues facilitates the pickup of carbon dioxide. That's the Haldane effect. While the Bohr effect is at the lung where when CO2 is brought back uh, to the lung and release of carbon dioxide from the hemoglobin at the lung, then that hemoglobin can easier pick up oxygen. This ends the part one of part three of the respiratory keyword topic review. And uh, this is a picture from the Blue Ridge Parkway where I did an unsupported camping trip and bicycling trip uh, and the trees were changing at this time. Very beautiful. I hope you have a great day.